Hello, everybody. This is uh, Dave again with the SIR Resident and Fellow section. Thanks for tuning in tonight for our talk. Um, I just wanted to tell, uh, advertise real quickly. Next week, we're having the first Interventional Oncology Journal Club with Drs. Lewandowski and Drs. Brown. Um, it should be a very exciting meeting. Uh, Dr. Haskell might actually stop by, uh, current editor of JVIR, to see how it goes. And depending on how it goes, we might be able to have future meetings. So I just wanted to let you know if you haven't registered for that, that's next week, July 23rd. I'm going to let Jeanette now introduce our speaker and uh, her involvement with the SIR RFS. So Jeanette. Go. Hi, thank you to Dr. Sharma for taking the time to talk to us today. Um, Dr. Sharma is a vascular medicine attending here at UVA who works very closely with the interventional radiology department. Um, he went to residency at St. Joseph's Mercy, Mercy Hospital in Ann Arbor, and then he did a fellowship in vascular medicine at Cleveland Clinic. His research interests include diagnosis and management of peripheral arterial disease, venous thromboembolism, and fibromuscular dysplasia. We're very pleased to have him talk to us today. Um, if you have questions, please type them in, and we will address as many as possible at the end. All right, thank you. And Dr. Sharma? Great. Thank you, Jeanette. Um, thank you for inviting me to give a talk on this um, interesting topic. Um, so we'll talk about cardiovascular prevention strategies in, in patients with peripheral arterial disease. So when we look at how many people have PAD, it's estimated that about 12 million Americans have PAD and up to 60 million are currently at risk for developing PAD in the near future. And when you look at further prevalences, uh, there have been many population-based studies that have been looked at this. And uh, one of the initial studies was the ENHANCE trial that looked at performing um, evaluation for PAD in patients about the age of 40. And they found that up to 4.3% of general population about the age of 40 had PAD. Uh, the one that really stood out was the partner trial, which uh, looked at patients seen in the primary care clinics, and um, they primarily looked at patients about the age of 70, or those between the age of 50 to 69 with history of diabetes or smoking, and found out that 29%, which is almost one out of three patients, had peripheral arterial disease. And those of us who actually have worked in primary care clinics will tell you that far majority of patient population falls under this criteria of more than 70 years old or be between 50 to 69 with either history of diabetes or, or smoking. So, so clearly PAD is very prevalent in our general population. PAD increases with age. Um, here we can see in both the studies, these were epidemiological studies, the Rotterdam study and the San Diego study that showed that after the age of 70, close to 20% of patients will have PAD regardless of presence or absence of risk factors. And as the age increases, especially after the age of 85, PAD will probably be seen in more than 50% of patients. Gender-wise, PAD seems to affect both genders fairly equally. And interestingly, after a certain age, it's seen more commonly in women than in men. When we look at risk factors, the one that truly stands out is smoking. However, PAD is associated with diabetes, hypertension, high cholesterol, um, some association with hyperhomocysteinemia, and inflammation is a major component of the presence of PAD. One of the important things to, see, to know is that smoking is six times more likely to cause PAD over actually coronary artery disease. Uh, so, so clearly this is a strong risk factor for peripheral arterial disease. Um, now, just talking a little bit about natural history of atherosclerotic PAD, uh, and this data comes uh, from uh, um, the American College of Cardiology, American Heart Association 2005 uh, PAD guidelines, and um, when they looked at initial presentation of patients presenting with PAD, what they found out is that up to 20 to 50 percent of these patients are asymptomatic, 40 to 50 percent will have atypical leg pain, Claudication is seen in 10 to 35 percent of patients, and critical ischemia is seen in only 1 to 2 percent of patients. However, when you look at outcomes-wise, one-year outcomes of patients with critical ischemia, suddenly a large number have amputation, but up to 25 percent will die of cardiovascular cause, and this is within one year of diagnosis of critical ischemia. Uh, 
Now, when we look at the rest of the population, those with um, claudication, atypical leg pain, or asymptomatic PAD, and when we look at their five-year outcome, it's also interesting. You know, we look at live morbidity, which is of major concern to most of us, and, and what we see is that patients with these symptoms of PAD, majority of them will continue to have the same amount of symptoms, so they'll, be, they'll have stable claudication. Up to 10 to 20 percent will have worsening claudication, and only 1 to 2 percent would actually go to critical limb ischemia. However, when you look at their cardiovascular morbidity and mortality, uh, this is very interesting. Within five years, up to 15 to 30 percent of these patients will die, and 75 percent of those dying would be related to a cardiovascular cause. And up to 20 percent of these patients will have a non-fatal cardiovascular event. So clearly they have a very high risk of cardiovascular morbidity and mortality. This was again a longitudinal study that looked at survival rates in PAD up to 12 years. And what they found out is that patients who did not have PAD have a fairly decent 10 to 12 year survival rate. Compared to those who have asymptomatic PAD, their survival rate is lower and it certainly gets worse as the degree of PAD worsens. Another 10-year natural study that looked at patients with intermittent claudication, um, this study came out of Cleveland Clinic, what, what they saw was that certainly the amputation rates are, are higher with, with PAD and the need for intervention is high uh, with, with these patients. Um, however, what really stands out is the higher rate of myocardial infarction and a much higher rate of, um, of mortality with a significant decrease in overall survival that we see with these patients. And mortality is certainly associated with ABIs also. Um, this is a new study that was performed and published in circulation and that clearly showed that as the ABIs drop, um, the risk of, uh, the, there is an increase in mortality and become non-compressible that is usually a sign of calcification and that is also associated with increased mortality. So, so we should be treating these patients carefully for cardiovascular reduction and also be treating these patients with non-compressible ABIs for cardiovascular reduction, uh, reduction with appropriate medications and risk factor modification. So, so why is there such high cardiovascular morbidity and mortality? And one of the reasons is that um, when, you know, I had earlier in the slide I've shown you the partner study data, which was the one in which primary care clinics were screened for PAD and they found that 29% of patients uh, in these clinics had, had peripheral arterial disease. Um, what they found out is that up to 50% of these patients had known coronary artery disease too. And, and so a large number of these patients who have lower extremity peripheral arterial disease will have cerebrovascular disease and um, coronary artery disease. Um, the, the Capri trial was a, uh, was a very famous trial that, that was um, performed in the 1980s and the 1990s. Uh, looking at up to 20,000 patients, um, and what they found out is that this particular trial of high-risk patients, high-risk vascular patients, a large number of patients had concomitant cerebrovascular coronary and peripheral arterial disease. This is another study that was also performed back in the 1990s, again uh, identified that a large percentage of patients would, ha uh, would have concomitant coronary or cerebrovascular disease when they have symptomatic peripheral arterial disease. And this is one of the main reasons why uh, we see such high cardiovascular morbidity and mortality in these patients. And, and this, is a, this is a very uh, classic uh, study that um, we probably will never be able to um, conduct again. And, and this study came out of Cleveland Clinic um, by the Vascular Surgery and the Vascular Medicine Group over there. Um, and in this particular study, what they did is they performed coronary angiograms in every vascular patient that was undergoing some form of surgery. Um, and so, so this was a more broad-based uh, evaluation. Of course, uh, they had patients who were undergoing AAA repair, patients undergoing lower extremity vascularization. Um, and uh, when they did coronary angiograms on them, they did a thousand coronary angiograms. And, and what they found out was that if they had no clinical suspicion for coronary disease, yet only 14% of those patients of these 1,000 patients who underwent angiograms, consequently, only 14% of these patients actually had normal coronary arteries. And when they suspected coronary disease clinically, 
only 4% of those patients had normal coronary artery. So a large number of these patients have significant um, coronary artery disease. And, and, and so this is, this is extremely important to, to know. And you know, this is some data that we probably will never be able to reproduce again. When you look at five-year mortality rates from PAD, this uh, is also very important to uh, slide because you can clearly see that here that PAD has at a much higher risk of, uh, of having mortality than perhaps Hodgkin's disease or breast cancer. However, um, these diseases give, are given more importance as compared to peripheral arterial disease. Um, and it's something that, you know, the, um, our group that deals a lot with vascular patients, we certainly should be aware of these facts. Now talking about how can we reduce the, the significantly elevated cardiovascular morbidity and mortality. So what can we do to prevent this increased cardiovascular morbidity and mortality in these patients with peripheral arterial disease? Um, and these are the few things that we certainly need to look at, which is smoking cessation, use of antiplatelet therapy, lipid lowering therapy, specifically using statins and the hypertensive therapy, um, mainly looking at use of ACE inhibitors, um, glycemic control, and exercise. So let's start first with statins. So the data on statins really came out in 2002 when the heart protection study was published. And the heart, the heart protection study was, was a huge trial that um, evaluated simvastatin 40 milligrams, and uh, this uh, study involved more than 20,000 patients. And of this 20,000 patients, uh, about 3,700 patients had peripheral arterial disease. And these patients were placed on simvastatin 40 milligrams or placebo. Um, and also, one thing that we should know is that their mean baseline LDL levels were 90 milligrams per deciliter. So, so they were already at 90, LDL of 90, and they were still put on simvastatin 40 milligrams versus placebo. And what they saw is there was a 24% reduction in overall cardiovascular morbidity and mortality in, by, by uh, giving a statin. And, and clearly this showed how, how important um, use of statin therapy is regardless of their baseline LDL levels. And so, so the analysis basically mentioned that about uh, by using simvastatin 40 milligrams for five years, you would prevent 100 people per thousand from having at least one major vascular event. This was an interesting study that was published in Circulation where they actually found that using simvastatin, sorry, using atorvastatin, um, either a 10 or 80 milligram dose, is actually an improvement in claudication. So there was actually an improvement in, um, in a peak walking time. The next question arose is, what dose of statin should we be using? Um, do we need to use a small dose of statin, or should we be using a larger dose of statin? And, and so this data was published um, by the um, Collaboration Trialist Treatment Group. Um, this was published in Lancet in 2010, where they compared simvastatin 80 milligrams, which would be the most statin group, versus simvastatin 20 milligrams, which would be the less statin group here. This data combined five major randomized clinical trials, and um, which consisted of over 39,000 patients, and they followed these patients for almost five years. And by using a higher dose of statin, they clearly showed a significant reduction in any major coronary event or any major vascular event. And, and this group consisted of patients, high-risk vascular patients, um, and, and clearly there was more benefit with using a high-intensity statin as compared to using a low intensity statin, regardless of what their patient's baseline LDL levels were. So based on all this data, the American College of Cardiology and American Heart Association in 2013 actually came up uh, with, a, with a new set of guidelines uh, about how we should be managing these patients. We've been always been taught to um, get patients to an LDL goal. Some follow an LDL goal of 100, others follow an LDL goal of 70. But based on all this data that more statin is, more intensive statin is probably better, uh, the American College of Cardiology and American Heart Associations came up with this guideline where they said that any patient with atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, so this could be coronary disease, this could be peripheral arterial disease, stroke related to carotid disease, 
if they have any of this and they are less than or equal to 75 years of age, these patients should be on a high intensity statin. And I'll talk about what exactly is a high intensity statin. But, but these patients need to be on a high intensity statin. And this is a class 1A recommendation. So this is a strong recommendation based on randomized clinical trial data. They further went ahead and said that if the patient's more than 75 years of age, um, or if it's not a candidate for high intensity statin, maybe related because of side effects from it that the patient may have suffered, then moderate intensity statin is, is okay to use. And this is more of an expert opinion. Um, and, and I think more of this, data, the, this recommendation of using a moderate intensity statin in patients about the age of 75 uh, was given because a large number of patients that were enrolled in these randomized clinical trials were not of an older age. And, and so that's the reason why they were a little lenient in, in this particular age group. But I think far majority of the patients, if, if, they can, if they have peripheral arterial disease and they can't tolerate a high intensity statin, they should be on a high intensity statin. So as you know, all this data came from reviewing randomized clinical trials. And uh, what is interesting is all these LDL targets that we were really using off, uh, looking at LDL targets of less than 100 or 70, there's really no study to say that we should be titrating our uh, target based on LDL levels and that it provides any uh, help with the cardiovascular reduction. It's more about how much the LDL is dropped. Is it dropped by 30 percent? Is it dropped by 50 percent from baseline? That is what has shown to actually provide more cardiovascular reduction benefits than just dropping it to a specific number. So coming at now what are high intensity statins? So high intensity statins are statins that can lower LDL by more than or equal to 50 percent. And currently what we have that we can use are atorvastatin, which, um, which um, uh, is at, at a dose of 40 milligrams to 80 milligrams. So atorvastatin 20 or 10 milligrams is not a high intensity statin. It needs to be 40 to 80 milligrams. Um, or rosuvastatin, which should be at a dose of 20 to 40 milligrams. Moderate intensity statins, again, are all these different statins, uh, which could be a total statin at 10 to 20 milligrams, uh, rosuvide 5 to 10 milligrams, simvastatin at 20 to 40 milligrams. Uh, please note that simvastatin 80 milligrams is no longer recommended to be used uh, because of an increased incidence of myopathy. So FDA doesn't actually recommend that we prescribe that anymore. Um, Pravastatin falls under the moderate intensity group and all these other drugs too. And so your patients with PAD typically should be on these two medications at specific doses of atorvastatin at 40 to 80 and uh, rosuvide at 20 to 40. And if they don't tolerate this, then only be considered for moderate intensity statin therapy. What's more interesting is in 2013 there was a uh, paper that was published that actually showed that statins even reduce amputation rates after lower extremity procedures. And this was the data that came out of Medicare um, patient database where they looked at almost 23,000 patients and clearly saw that patients or statins are more likely to, um, more likely, uh, are less likely to undergo amputation as compared to those who are not on statins. So this is a, a, another study that's very interesting and it's, it's not related to lower extremity peripheral arterial disease but it is related to atherosclerosis. And so the study was done um, in um, London, Ontario in Canada where um, they actually look at patients, this, this is patients with asymptomatic carotid stenosis and uh, after 2003 they, um, they started uh, looking at the carotid plaque and based on plaque intensifying statin and not just looking at LDL levels. Um, and, and they would use high intensity statins in these patients and so they were actually doing transcranial uh, Doppler emboli monitoring and looking at how many microemboli go through um, with these patients. Uh, and so they call this um, treatment program as uh, treating arteries rather than just risk factors. Um, they clearly intensified statins if the plaque content was increasing regardless of what the patient's LDL level was. And even with treating three diabetic patients with pyoglitzona metformin. And, and what they found out is that once they instituted this program, the incidence of stroke death or symptoms leading to them call, uh, having these patients undergo carotid endarterectomies dropped from 17.6% to 5.6%. So this was a significant improvement that they just found by just using high intensity statin and monitoring plaque progression. 
So, uh, so this so the bottom line comes down to is I think we need to have our patients on high intensity statins if they have lower extremity peripheral arterial disease. Um, now let's talk about other risk factors uh, such as hypertension. So hypertension, uh, you know, uh, we have recommended uh, lowering blood pressures to certain goals for a long time because it has shown to help reduce the risk of uh, stroke myocardial infarction, congestive heart failure, chronic renal failure, or death. Um, we followed the GNC7 guidelines for many years, which basically told us that we should try to lower our patient's blood pressure, systolic blood pressure to less than 130 and diastolic to less than 80. The GNC7, uh, the GNC8 guidelines is a little different from GNC7. The GNC8 guidelines came out this year uh, and was published in JAMA, and, and their recommendations are, are a little different. Um, it's, it's very interesting um, because uh, they found that lowering blood pressures up to 130 or, or going below that wasn't providing any additional benefit. And, and the guidelines currently recommend that if, if your patient's between 30 to 59 years of age, and um, then you should initiate pharmacotherapy based on their diastolic blood pressure. If the diastolic is more than 90, then only consider treating that, um, that hypertension. Um, however, they do add an expert opinion to it, and what they mention is that if the systolic is more than 140, it is not unreasonable to consider uh, pharmacotherapy too. And, and to go further, they say about patients who are older than 60 years of age, they actually recommend uh, treating with, uh, with pharmacotherapy only if the systolic blood pressure is more than 150 or the diastolic blood pressure is more than 90. Again, they have an expert opinion saying it's not unreasonable to consider treating them with blood pressure medications if the, if the, if the systolic blood pressure is more than 140. So it's, it's a little um, different from what we've been doing for years. Um, however, um, you know, it, it's interesting and it's, it's being debated a lot right now about what would be the best option in, in, in our patients who clearly have a lot of um, increased morbidity and mortality related to hypertension. Um, so specifically, I wanted to talk about use of ACE inhibitors. Um, and, um, and so this is one chart I wanted you just to have you look at. And, um, and so this uh, specifically is looking at how ACE inhibitors work. And, and so, you know, we obviously have the renin angiotensin aldosterone system that looks at various factors, and, and the system uh, makes, uh, causes a few things. It, it causes waste of constriction, oxidative stress, um, causes left ventricular remodeling, abnormalities, and vascular remodeling and endothelial dysfunction. And so ACE inhibitors, when it acts on, on a cycle, it not only just lowers blood pressure, but it actually affects all these other factors. Um, and, and so ACE inhibitors have also shown some added benefits. And so before, before we go to ACE, I wanted to talk to you about uh, this particular study, which sort of contradicts our data, our guideline recommendation by GNC8. Um, and in this particular study, um, the ABCD trial, they used either enalapril or uh, nisol depend, so either an ACE inhibitor or a calcium channel blocker. And the study involved about uh, 500 patients or so. Um, and they used intensive versus moderate treatment. So intensive treatment for blood pressure was lowering blood pressure less than 130 by 80. And uh, what they found out is that uh, there was a significant reduction in uh, myocardial infarction, stroke, or vascular death in, in CAD patients if you treated that blood pressure intensively. Now, was it the effect of enalapril or, uh, or nisolpicin um, drugs, or was this truly by lowering blood pressure is, is now questioned. The HOPE trial was a very interesting trial in, in which patients were prescribed ramipril versus placebo, uh, regardless of their blood pressure level. So, so a large majority of these patients had, had fairly well controlled blood pressure and they were still prescribed uh, ramipril. And uh, what was seen is that especially patients, of course, with all kinds of disorders, but even patients with peripheral vascular disease had a significant reduction. Um, had a significant reduction in uh, overall cardiovascular morbidity and mortality uh, when ramipril and ACE inhibitor was used. And more recently, uh, ramipril has uh, gone uh, a further level where they have actually used ramipril in patients with intermittent claudication and found out that, uh, uh, and so this was a double-blinded randomized controlled trial uh, where patients with intermittent claudication received ramipril uh, 
and they found out that the peak walking time improved by 77% in patients who took Ramipril, um, and the maximum walking time improved by 123% in, in these patients who took Ramipril. So clearly, it has more benefits than lowering um, just blood pressure. It clearly by itself lowers overall cardiovascular morbidity and mortality, and perhaps by um, acting on endothelial dysfunction and vasoconstriction, um, it actually further improves um, PAB symptoms and reduces claudication. Yep. We're talking about the other risk factor, which is diabetes. Um, and this is very interesting. So uh, with diabetes, there has been a more paradigm shift now where we no longer control diabetes as aggressively as we used to before. Uh, however, um, controlling diabetes aggressively in PAD patients stands true. Um, this was a big trial, which was a UK PDS study, where they looked at patients being controlled with intensive treatment, which was having a hemoglobin A1C less than 7 very aggressively versus um, just conventional treatment, so, so a little bit higher was considered okay. Um, and none of the clinical, sample, uh, clinical outcome points actually stood out except for one thing. Patients who were on intensive control, intensive uh, control of their hemoglobin A1C or intensive control of their diabetes had a, a overall slightly redu slight reduction in amputation or death from peripheral vascular disease. So this particular group still sound, stood out stating that, you know, perhaps we should be controlling the diabetes well and it does come out, um, it does stand out in terms of redu reducing uh, amputations and death. So now the medications have been looked at too. Uh, the other one was pyoglitazone where uh, when they looked at uh, overall uh, cardiovascular morbidity and mortality, pyoglitazone had about a 10% reduction, risk reduction um, in these events. However, this was not noted to be statistically significant. When they looked at all-cause mortality, they did have a 16% risk reduction uh, with it, which was statistically significant. So the American College of Cardiology and American Heart Association currently would recommend that diabetic patients should have a hemoglobin A1C level. Um, diabetic patients with PAD should have a hemoglobin A1C level of less than 7, and this is mainly to reduce microvascular complications and potentially improve cardiovascular outcomes. Another important thing that they recommend is that patients with PAD and diabetes should have good foot care. They should be regularly seen for dietary. We should talk to them about keeping their skin clean and dry and applying uh, moisturizing cream uh, because a simple break in the skin can lead to a non-healing ulcer which could eventually lead to an amputation. Now let's talk about anaplatelet therapy. So the first data on anaplatelet therapies uh, what came out from the antiplatelet trialist collaboration study which combined over 145 randomized clinical trials um, of uh, anaplatelet agents, and this constituted about 100,000 patients, so it's a huge database. Um, and what they found out is that any group of patients, those who had stroke, MI, prior MI, other kind of high-risk patients such as PAD, all of them had a reduction in their overall cardiovascular morbidity and mortality um, when it came to using anaplatelet agents. And far majority of these patients in this particular trial were on aspirin. And this was back in 1990s, so we didn't have any of our new agents that, that we have now. So just, based with, just with using aspirin, a large number of these patients had anywhere from a 22 to 32 uh, percent risk reduction. They specifically then looked at PAD patients within this group. And what they found out is that when you look at all PAD patients, there's again clearly an overall 22% reduction in cardiovascular morbidity and mortality. The CUPRI trial was another trial that uh, tried to look at um, and see if, if we used clopidogrel um, over aspirin, would that actually provide any more additional risk reduction? And, and the data on that was interesting. First of all, Capri trial looked at all high-risk vascular patients, so it didn't just look at patients with PAD. Um, however, they did do a subgroup analysis on the PAD patients, and uh, what they found out 
was that clopidogrel um, certainly causes, uh, certainly provides additional risk reduction as compared to all other fact, all other um, cardiovascular uh, disorders. Um, and, and so it, this was very interesting. However, this was a subgroup analysis, and unfortunately, um, we never had another randomized control trial just looking at uh, clopidogrel versus aspirin. So, so this was taken into good consideration, but not really um, used often in clinical practice. So the American College of Cardiology and American Heart Association currently recommends that all our patients with peripheral arterial disease, especially those who are symptomatic or those who have had lower extremity revascularization procedures, should be on an antiplatelet therapy. Um, those who are asymptomatic and have PAD should also be strongly considered to be on antiplatelet therapy. And they go further to state that clopidogrel is certainly a safe and effective alternative agent to aspirin. Um, in, uh, in our patients too. So it's not unreasonable to use clopidogrel. However, they don't say that it is superior to aspirin. Now uh, let's talk a little bit more about smoking. So as I had mentioned that smoking is actually associated more with peripheral arterial disease compared to coronary artery disease. Um, and what's really interesting is that smoking actually kills more people than alcohol, cocaine, heroin, homicide, suicide, car accidents, fires, and AIDS all combined together. So, so clearly this is, this is a big problem. Your patients will tell you that sometimes the way they smoke is, is harmless, that they don't inhale their smoke uh, and so on. That's not really true. I think if you smoke, even if you smoke a small amount, it is harmful to you. And I think this is something you should, you should realize that. So the current recommendation is that uh, the United States Preventive Task Force states that any provider, physician, nurse practitioner, specialist, primary care provider, everybody, if they have a patient who smokes, it is really some, it is something that we should address on each of our clinic visits. And that it is effective to provide behavioral counseling, screening, and pharmacotherapy to help them with quitting smoking. So when we talk about what kind of interventions we have, we have behavioral therapy, which is self-help material, brief advice, counseling, exercise, and, um, and the pharmacotherapy typically are nicotine replacement therapies, bupropion, which a lot of us know as Wellbutrin, and Varaniclin, which a lot of us know as Chantix. So um, now, chant, uh, and now so nicotine replacement comes in different forms. The most common form that we are aware of is the nicotine patch. Um, typically, it's recommended that um, we should give them a 21 milligram patch if they smoke more than 10 cigarettes a day. And if they smoke less than 10 cigarettes a day, a 14 milligram patch would be adequate. Another alternative is a nicotine gum. Again, if patients smoke more than 25 cigarettes a day, a 4 milligram gum is better. Uh, if they smoke um, less than 25 cigarettes a day, 2 milligram gum are, are okay to be used. The other option is uh, lozenges. They, they even provide nicotine lozenges and nicotine nasal spray. And, you know, um, I, I often do this uh, in my clinic, and um, for some patients, one form of nicotine replacement would be more suitable as compared to others. And I often see patients who, who may not, uh, may feel that the patch doesn't help them, but then when they use the spray, it's actually more effective in helping them quit smoking. So um, this is again strongly recommended. Um, a Cochrane database analysis that looked at 103 randomized trials showed that nicotine replacement therapy in any form had a two-fold increased abstinence rate from smoking um, as compared to not using anything. Um, so clearly this is something we should consider for our patients who smoke. Wellbutrin or bupropion is another alternative that off, can often be used. Um, and um, it has also been well evaluated. And uh, again, a Cochrane database that looked at uh, a meta-analysis of more than 40 randomized clinical trials showed that Wellbutrin doubled the odds of smoking cessation when compared to placebo or alternative pharmacotherapy, which typically was nicotine replacement therapy.
lastly, Chantix um, has also been well evaluated. Uh, also, um, you know, the, the name is actually better Nicklin, but most of us know it as Chantix. This is also fairly well evaluated, and um, and up to six randomized clinical trials have compared this to either nicotine replacement therapy or placebo and found out that, um, that varinexlin actually tripled the odds of smoking cessation. And so here's the different um, abstinence rates that you see typically with all these different pharmacotherapies. Um, and it is highly variable, but, um, but varinexlin typically and bupropion are more effective um, as compared to nicotine replacement therapy. However, um, in clinical practice, um, I often use um, two agents at the same time. So I will often use nicotine replacement therapy with milbutrin or, or, or valinexlin too. And what is interesting is that when you combine medications along with behavioral therapy or brief counseling, it is actually more effective than medications alone or counseling alone. So you really have to have a multi-prong approach in these patients. And, and the more intensive the counseling is, the more likely it is that you would help your patients from quitting smoking. And, and this is a study that was done at Mayo Clinic that showed that patients who try to quit on their own, only 1% are successful. Now when you combine that to physician's advice, so when these patients come to your clinic and you tell them you should quit smoking, it, it goes up to 3%, but, but not a whole lot. With uh, weekly counseling, it goes up to 6 to 8%. Um, you know, combine this with weekly counseling, physician advice, with medications, it can go up to 20%. Um, you have an intensive counseling session program for these patients where you have somebody who calls them, follows with them, make sure they didn't start smoking again, um, then the abstinence rates go high, high as up to 22%. And in fact, at Mayo Clinic, they even did a 10-day inpatient program for these patients, which actually showed their these patients abstinence rates to up to 50%. Um, and this is a, a, a one-year follow-up rate, so this is clearly very successful. So the more intensive your behavior counseling is, with use of multiple um, cessation uh, pharmacotherapy, um, the more likely it is that your patient will quit smoking. And these are just a, a number of resources that you can use, uh, online resources for your patients to help uh, in quitting smoking. Uh, one thing I should mention you, e-cigarettes is, is a big thing now, and often your patients will ask you if they can use e-cigarettes. Uh, as a physician, though, you should know that e-cigarettes um, are not FDA approved. They have not really been evaluated or submitted for uh, for FDA approval either. So we uh, we hope that they don't have any toxins in them, but we really don't know that. And, and so um, as a physician, I, I don't uh, recommend e-cigarettes as an alternator. Um, I will typically go through the other more established routes, as we discussed uh, So the last thing I want to talk about was exercise therapy. Um, with, uh, with exercise therapy, you know, it, um, interestingly, it does reduce limb symptoms. It uh, improves uh, exercise capacity and reduces uh, physical disability and does reduce overall cardiovascular event. Um, in, a tr uh, in this uh, in a nice review article that was actually just published in 2011 in, in circulation, they saw that even in asymptomatic patients, there is actually a significant decline in overall functional impairment in these patients. And so even if your patients have PAD and are asymptomatic, we should still recommend exercise therapy for these patients. A meta-analysis that was published back in 1995 showed that supervised exercise therapy in claudic Hens actually improved their walking time by up to 180 percent, as compared to those who were not put in on a, who were not put on a supervised exercise therapy program. So clearly, exercise therapy is very effective in patients with peripheral arterial disease. A Cochrane uh, review also was performed, and uh, obviously this included the same number of probably the same amount of studies that was done in the meta-analysis that I just showed you. But they also clearly mentioned that that um, supervised exercise therapy improved walking ability by 50 to 200 um, percent and hence is something that we should recommend for all of our patients with peripheral arterial disease. A lot of you already probably know about this study that was performed um, 
uh, just a few years ago and was pu published in Circulation in 2012, where they compared patients um, with intermittent claudication and those who had aortoiliac disease, um, and they compared them to undergoing supervised exercise therapy versus primary stenting. And all of us know that aortoiliac disease stenting actually has very good outcomes. So, so they compared these two group of patients to see what outcomes they would have. So here's the study design of this trial, which was a clever trial. Um, they actually had four groups initially. One was the opti optimal medical therapy group, where celastrozole was given. Um, then was the angioplasty stent group, um, the supervised exercise therapy group, and the last group was the angioplasty with supervised exercise therapy. Unfortunately, this group eventually fizzled out uh, because of lack of recruitment in this particular trial, and only these three groups were left. And when they looked at six-month outcomes in these patients. Um, so before going at six-month outcomes, when you when you look at other things, um, celastrozole in the optical medical, optimal medical therapy group, compliance was more than 90%, so this was very effective. Patients in the supervised size therapy group, about 70% of them were compliant with their exercise program. And those in the stenting group, um, stent placement without any complications was excellent. And there was no crossover in any of these groups. So this is uh, clearly very important. Um, and you, when you look at their overall data, this is very interesting, but um, peak walking time was actually higher in the supervised exercise therapy group than even in the stenting group. So, uh, so obviously both of these groups had um, this exercise therapy and the stenting group. Patients walked a lot more than those who were in the medical therapy group. But exercise therapy group patients actually walk more than that of the stenting group. And when they looked at chronic cancer time, optical medical therapy group had no significant improvement in chronic time, just, just a mild improvement. However, exercise group and stenting group had a, a lot sig more significant improvement in the chronic onset time. Um, the the exercise group was higher than the exercise group. However, this was noted not to be statistically significant. One thing that really stood out was also the fact that when we looked at just baseline community walking, patients in the stenting group were more likely to walk as compared to those in the exercise group. Again, this didn't stand out as being um, significant, uh, statistically significant, but, but it's something that showed a higher trend. So we have other benefits of, um, of supervised exercise therapy in these patients. You know, exercise therapy not only just improves walking time, but it um, actually pro provides improvement in lipids, um, reduction in obesity indices, uh, reduction in blood pressure, reduction in inflammation. It actually helps with uh, improvement in insulin resistance and better control of diabetes and overall um, significant reduction in depression and psychosocial uh, stress too. So, so there's a lot of benefits with exercise therapy. And so the, currently the American College of Cardiology actually recommends that all patients with peripheral arterial disease should be, rec should be advised to undergo supervised exercise training program in an appropriate rehabilitation center. The problem really comes is with CMS. Um, supervised exercise therapy program is currently not paid for for peripheral arterial disease. And that's one of our major limiting factors of getting our patients in to rehab centers to have them undergo this um, to have them undergo um, this program. However, um, Dr. Gardner from the University of Oklahoma came up with a home exercise program where patients used uh, a form of pedometer and were, and were monitored as to how much they were walking on a daily basis. And, and they compared that group of patients with those who were undergoing supervised exercise in a rehabilitation center versus those who just had regular medical care. And what was interesting is when they looked at outcome times, which uh, was the claudication onset time and the peak walking time, as well as the secondary outcome that was the daily ambulatory cadences measured for a seven-day monitoring period, what they found out is that among both the exercise groups, supervisor home base, the claudication onset time and peak walking time was better than doing nothing. However, changes between those at both the exercise groups when compared together was actually not significant, statistically significant. So, so the home exercise therapy group did as well as the supervised exercise therapy group, uh, which is very assuring now. Uh, 
what was also interesting is when you looked at the daily average cadence, so the daily average walking, um, home exercise therapy group actually walked more than the supervised exercise therapy group. Another important thing is exercise therapy actually works even after intervention. And so this is an article um, that was published in JVIR in a, in a study that was conducted in Europe where they randomized their patients with aortoiliac disease to either undergo stenting or undergo stenting and then be put in a supervised exercise therapy program. And what they found out is that patients uh, who were in the, in the stenting with supervised exercise therapy program actually walked more. Um, up to 271 meters more than those who just underwent stenting. So clearly, um, even if your patients undergo revascularization, putting them in an exercise program, either supervised or, or just ther medical therapy group, um, either supervised or home exercise is, is extremely important. So in conclusion, um, when you have a patient with peripheral arterial disease that, that you either revascularize or don't revascularize, some of the things that you should clearly be aware of and make sure that they are on is, is that they should be on an antiplatelet agent, either aspirin or clopidogrel. Now we have an ongoing uh, trial called the Euclid trial that's looking at ticagrelor compared to clopidogrel, so, so we'll come to know if that agent is superior or not, but for now it's either aspirin or clopidogrel. These patients should be on a high-intensity statin, and in certain select cases, moderate-intensity statin would be okay. If there are no contraindications, they should be on an ACE inhibitor. They should have aggressive risk factor modification and should be put on an exercise program whether or not they have undergone any form of intervention. And even if they are asymptomatic, you should still consider to put them on an exercise therapy program. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sharma. Um, we will take some, a few questions now. I've received a few, um, and anyone else, please uh, type them in as we're talking. Dr. Sharma, one of the people in the audience wants to know, they say, it, it is my understanding that antibiotics may show some promise in treating abdominal aortic aneurysms. Is there any study demonstrating benefit in patients with lower extremity PAD? <laughs> Um, so in, in terms of, um, yeah, so I think what you're really looking at is with antibiotics, um, I believe doxycycline is one of the agents that's been looking at, been looked at, and, I, I, and from my understanding that's more again looking at reducing inflammation, and it, maybe it will, so I think none of the, those trials have really panned out as yet, um, to even show if it helps with AAA, but if the concept is looking at reduction of inflammation, um, it, it may potentially work, but there's, um, I don't think there's actually been any, any studies that have looked at it, or if, even if they have been done, there's nothing that I've heard of that has been successful. Okay. Another question from the audience. Um, are you worried about Chantix and the hallucinations, suicidal ideations? How do you discuss this and evaluate for this? So before you prescribe, um, uh, so, so yeah, so that, that's a that's a that's a good question, and I think before you prescribe somebody with um, with Chantix, uh, one thing that you should be aware of is to make sure they don't have any history of psychiatric disorders, especially depression, um, because that does put them uh, at a higher risk of having uh, suicidal ideations and and other sort of uh, side effects. Um, so uh, there is also an increased signal of uh, increased um, myocardial infarctions in patients with. Uh, 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 in patients who are on Chantix, uh, but hasn't been very well validated. Um, so often in clinic, my approach is more um, initially I will try um, nicotine replacement with Wellbutrin and aggressive uh, behavioral counseling. We actually have a clinical pharmacist who provides continuous behavioral counseling. So, so a lot of these patients, when they come see me, I'll, I'll provide them with the medications, speak to them about, you know, give them physician advice. Uh, but after they see me, they actually see her. They spend almost 30 minutes with her where she looks at their trigger factors, you know, all those kind of things, and, and comes up with better plans of how they could avoid cigarettes. Um, and if they are, you know, somehow triggered to, to get a cigarette, how they could use other factors to prevent that. And 
And so we tried that approach first, and if it's not working, we will try Chantix, but I warn them of these symptoms, and if they clearly have psychiatric or have depression, I, I will stay away from using Chantix in those patients. Thank you. Another question. I've recently heard the results from the TACT trial, which looked at using chelation therapy and reducing cardiovascular mortality in post-MI patients. We would be interested in hearing your thoughts on this. You know, um, so I actually don't know a whole lot about that. I, I'll probably have to do a little more. Uh, um, I'll have to look into that a little bit more. I, I, it's not something that we often we do that in our patients. Uh, so, so clearly, I, um, uh, it's not a part of our clinical practice as of now. And um, uh, honestly, I actually don't know a whole lot about that. So, if I, if I say anything, I, I, I'll probably be wrong. Okay. Um, another question. So, dual antiplatelet therapy is discouraged. The power of the study that showed Plavix preference in PID was low. Yeah. Uh, so, the benefit of dual antiplatelet therapy for PID is is uh, not established. Um, we um, what was seen is there's no significant reduction uh, in overall morbidity or mortality, and there's probably increased bleeding. Um, now, there are certain situations where you use dual antiplatelet therapy, especially if, you're, if the patient's undergone some kind of stenting procedure, but that's primarily just uh, for, uh, um, uh, you know, just to avoid stent thrombosis, so uh, nothing more than that. So if you, if you have them, clinically, typically we'll have these patients on aspirin, uh, probably just on 81 milligrams of aspirin, um, and for the majority of the time, that probably is okay. Okay. Um, they'd also like to know uh, which ACE inhibitor do you use, uh, lisinopril versus ramipril? Um, I use lisinopril, um, I, but if you truly want to look at clinical data, I think uh, ramipril clearly um, is the is the drug that has been more studied. Um, um, but um, um, you know, by the time patients come to see us, large majority of them are are, are on an ACE inhibitor and typically are on lisinopril. Um, <laughs> Ramipril at times can have issues with insurance. <coughs> Excuse me, um, but um, you know it, it, it's uh, it's highly um, dependent on what the patient's insurance status is and, and so on. Um, based and based on that, I'll prescribe. Lisinopril is on the four dollar formulary list on in Walmart, so so a large number of uh, patients can easily get that. Thank you. Are there any other questions? So that was all that I had received from the audience. If not, um, thank you so much, Dr. Sharma. That was a really wonderful talk. Um, we really appreciate your time and effort. How do, how do you choose between dosing the 40 milligram versus the 80 milligram atorvastatin? So, so, um, so that that's a, that's a yeah, that's a very interesting question, and that that can be tough at times. How, how do you decide what what are you going to do with your patient? Uh, if they are started naive, um, I will start them on um, Lipitor 40 milligrams, so a majority of the time. And what you should do is actually um, you look at how much LDL reduction have you seen, and so if you see more than a 50 percent LDL reduction with Lipitor 40 milligrams itself, so that's typically sufficient then for now, um, then then I would just leave them on that. Now, if you don't see a, a more than 50% reduction in their LDL, then I will uh, increase the dose to 80 milligrams of, of Lipitor. Again, this is, you know, again, we are looking at LDL levels, so it might not be the most ideal way, and maybe in the future we will actually be looking at quantity of plaque and then deciding how much statin therapy we should have these patients on, um, you know, and how, how much plaque is increasing, and based on that titrate statin therapy uh, rather than doing what we are doing right now. And that, that's what they, are, you know, they have been doing in London, Ontario uh, with their carotid patients, and they have seen a significant um, reduction in their cardiovascular morbidity and mortality. Another question that's just come in, um, what's your algorithm for LFT checks, CK checks, and LDL checks timing with the initiation of your statins? Okay. Um, so, so if you're a patient who's, who's statin naive and, um, and you, you are initiating statins in these patients at that time, so, so this is more of a, you know, a, a, this is an ACC recommendation. So this is, this is not just what I do in my clinic, but this is what is recommended um, nationally by clinical guidelines. And, 
So what you should do is you should check their liver function test at baseline. Now if they don't have any muscle aches, there is no need to check a CK level at baseline. Uh, check their lipids, check their liver function test, and then start them on a statin. Um, you should have them back to see you in clinic in about two to three months or so. And at that time, recheck their liver function test and their lipids to see how much LDL reduction have you received, is there more than a 50% LDL reduction, and to make sure that their LFTs are not trending up. And, and if at that time they have any muscle symptoms, then you could check a CK level. But if they don't have any muscle symptoms um, that sound like statin myopathy, um, then don't, don't check a CK level. Uh, because a lot of asymptomatic patients will have muscle enzyme elevation and then you're stuck with this result that, um, that doesn't really relate to your drugs. All right, and one more question. Uh, do you come across patients who complain of chronic post-PBI pain, like those who have chronic post-PCI pain? How has your experience been with that? Um, so yeah, I, I think you will, um, you know, uh, revascularization is not, not perfect, so it does provide a lot of patients with improvement in their claudication, but it doesn't go away completely. Uh, in fact, a large number of patients will have some amount of claudication. Um, in fact, if you, even if you have somebody with aortoediac disease that you have excellent outcomes and, if they, and they will probably not complain of any claudication to you, but you, if you put them on a treadmill machine um, and have them walk for five minutes on a treadmill, they will develop claudication eventually. Um, and and uh, so so really, you know, these are the patients. I think uh, if they have any persistent claudication, uh, you should put them on a supervised exercise therapy program. Um, in fact, all my patients um, or, or an exercise therapy program, all my patients after even if they undergo any kind of revascularization procedure, I will tell them to walk on a regular basis. Uh, some of them, um, you know, will will get a pedometer and see how fast, uh, you know, how how many. Um, steps they take and, uh, and a lot of them have shown significant improvement uh, with that. Uh, at times I have patients who actually have a treadmill machine at their home and, and they will almost undergo a, a supervised exercise therapy program. Of course they, they do it on their own but, but uh, they will walk on the treadmill um, you know, three to five times a day for almost 30 minutes a day and keep pushing themselves as much as they can. Um, so, so that's, you know, that's um, so, uh, so I, I think it's, it's not uncommon. You will often see patients, even after you revascularize, to have some amount of claudication. And, and the best thing to do is, is to put them on an exercise pro, uh, program uh, to prevent the progression of the symptoms. Thank you. What elevation of LFTs do you stop with that? Uh, typically, it's... Uh, so, so elevation of statins, typically, it's um, considered... Um, significant if it's three times the upper normal limit. Um, if it's less than three times the upper normal limit, I'll probably still continue the statin but have them recheck their liver function test in a month or so to make sure it's not, you know, it doesn't keep going up and it doesn't go above the three times the upper normal limit. Um, if it goes more than three times the upper normal limit and clearly there's nothing else that's causing the liver el enzyme elimination and it's all statin, then, then at that time I, I would I would stop that statin and maybe try something else or maybe try at a lower dose. Well, if that is all the questions we have, thank you so much, Dr. Sharma. This has been a wonderful talk. We really appreciate your time.